Keep tuned now for Robert Young, starring in Father Knows Best, which follows immediately after this listening reminder. Tomorrow evening, two great NBC comedy shows return to the airwaves. The Bob Hope Show and the Phil Harris, Alice Faye Show. Yes, Bob Hope and Phil Harris join forces to make Friday night one of the happiest nights on NBC radio. With Bob, you'll hear lovely Margaret Whiting and Les Brown and his band of renown. And with Phil Harris and Alice Faye will be Elliot Lewis, Julius Abruzio, Brother William, and little Alice and Phyllis. Be sure to hear them beginning tomorrow night on NBC radio. Now stay tuned for Father Knows Best, next on NBC. Now listen to Father Knows Best, transcribed starring Robert Young as Father. Welcome to Springfield and another half-hour visit with the folks in the white frame house on Maple Street. Sit back and enjoy life with the Andersons, Kathy, Bud, Betty, Margaret, and Jim, as the head of this typical American household again sets out to prove that father knows best. Yes, we're in Springfield, but at the moment, not in the white frame house on Maple Street. Instead, Jim Anderson is in the family car driving down Springfield's Main Street, accompanied by a backseat driver. No, no correction. A front seat talker, Jim's daughter, Betty. Jim is trying to do two things at once. As a member in good standing of the Safe Drivers Club, he is trying to navigate the busy traffic in safety, while at the same time listening to his daughter, Betty. Like this. Father. Hmm? Father, what would you say our position was? Oh, I don't know. How about third base? That's a pretty good spot. <laughs> you know what I mean. There's a red light. Thank you. What's this about our position? Somebody been saying something? Oh, no, I was just wondering. I mean, after all, you are a pretty important man in Springfield. People don't get to be district managers just like that. Well, I guess there are some people who, uh... <clears throat> that is, I wouldn't exactly say, The uh, light screen. Thank you very <laughs> much. I don't know how I could possibly drive this car without your assistance. Father? Now, what's the matter? Father, if people have a certain position, they should certainly live up to it, don't you think? I try to. Occasionally. That's what I told Grace the other day, and she said I was absolutely right. Who's Grace? Oh, you know, Father. She's the man who owns the lumberyard's daughter. <laughs> She's the who? The man who owns the lumberyard's daughter. Since when does the lumberyard have a daughter? The man does. You know what I mean. I guess so. Didn't they teach English in your school? Naturally. There's a dog in the road. I see the dog. The dog sees me. It is a pretty dog. Green and yellow spots. I was just telling you. Well, you can just stop telling me. What about the girl who owns the lumberyard's father? You mean Grace? Oh, well, we decided that there are certain obligations a girl has to her father. Hmm. For instance, if you wear a certain dress to a commencement party, you shouldn't wear the same one to a church social or people will talk. About the father, I mean. In other words, you want a new dress. It's beautiful, Father. It's the most beautiful dress you ever saw. No. My name is Anderson, not Rockefeller. But I spoke to the woman at Gorman's and she says they're practically giving it away. They are not giving it to me. But, Father, there's a red light. <laughs> Betty, I know there's a red light. I have a peculiar habit of watching to see whether or not the light has turned red. The dress is red, too, Father, and it has absolutely no shoulders. It's just simply dreamy. Betty, I will not have my daughter walking around in one of those dresses. Makes a girl look as if she's being squeezed out of a tube of toothpaste. <laughs> Besides, they're enough to give a parent heart failure. But, Father, they can't possibly fall down. I wouldn't care if you got a written guarantee from the president. <laughs> you may not have one of those dresses. The light's green. 
I know the light's green. Father, you're losing your temper. I'm not losing my temper. I have perfect control of my temper. And the car. Oh. Well? The motor stalled. Oh. Oh, what's the matter with this thing? Father, you're holding up traffic. Well, can I help it if the full motor's flooded? Oh, go ahead, blow your horns, you rattle-brained nincompoops. Father, you're making a scene. There's one thing I hate, it's a horn blower. Nothing but a bunch of clock watches in an automobile. <sighs> father, all the girls are wearing dresses without shoulders, and their father... Betty, we'll not discuss it any further. You'll get a dress with shoulders, or you won't get any. But, Father... And stop butt-fathering me. That's final. All right, Father, I guess you know best. You're darn right I do. Oh, I can get my bus at this corner. Okay. There you are. Now remember, Betty, with shoulders. Yes, Father, I'll remember. With shoulders. Goodbye now. See you tonight. Wait a minute. With shoulders. Why did I say she could get a new dress? <laughs> but... Want me, Dad? Yes. Yeah, say, Bud, this lawn looks like it could stand a little trimming. How about it? Yes, sir. I'm going to get on it right now. I'll cut it like it's never been cut before. Well, let's not have anything spectacular. Just cut it. <laughs> okay. Then I'll get started on the roses. I can cut them back a little, spray the bugs, give them a shot of fertilizer. Oh, and after I get through uh, cultivating all the flower beds, would you like me to wash the car? Bud, do you feel all right? <laughs> sure, I feel fine. No temperature. Let me see your tongue. Oh, Dad, cut it out, will you? Gosh, just because I decided to do a little work around here... I still don't get it. Well, I was just reading the newspaper, and... Did you know that there was a minimum wage scale? Seventy-five cents an hour. Mm, the light is beginning to dawn. And there's some talk that Congress might raise it to a dollar an hour. I take it, Mr. Anderson, you are dissatisfied with your present allowance. Well, a dollar a week isn't much. When I was your age, bud, I got no allowance at all. If I needed money, I earned it. I did odd jobs around the neighborhood. I ran errands, shoveled snow, mowed lawns. Well, that's what I want to do. But for you? At 75 cents an hour. Oh, gosh, you wouldn't want me to argue with Congress, would you? <laughs> you know, bud, I think you've got something. I have? Gee. How much time had you figured on giving us at your uh, new low rate? Well, uh, I figured four hours on Saturday and four on Sunday. Do you suppose you could afford that? That'd be six dollars a week. I think we can manage. Oh, boy, let me have that lawnmower. I gotta get started. Uh, just a minute, bud. Before you start the run on the treasury, there ought to be another side to this bargain, you know. As a wage earner, naturally, you'll want to contribute something to the support of the household. I will? <laughs> a man earning a man's way in the world, you'll want to make a slight donation for, uh, say, food. Food? <laughs> 21 meals per week. We won't count what happens in between. Gosh, uh, I, I hardly eat anything at all. I'll bet I've got the worst appetite in the whole family. There are elephants who would have trouble eating one of your breakfasts. <laughs> but we won't argue the point. Let's say a dime a meal. Is that fair? Well, I guess so. All right. That's two ten. Now your room. Nice, bright, airy. How about two dollars a week? What if I move into the garage? <laughs> one eighty. Well, for twenty cents, I'll stay in my room. A very wise decision. Now, let's see. Laundry. Oh, we'll make that 40 cents. Mm -hmm. Clothing repair and replacement, uh, 80 cents. Telephone calls at 5 cents per call, uh, 70 cents. Yeah. School supplies and equipment, 60 cents. Mm -hmm. Breakage and uh, general overhead. Bud, where are you going? I just remembered, Dad. I promised to meet the fellas. I'll cut the grass later. Come back here. We had a deal. <laughs> oh, well... I can always pay myself 75 cents an hour. But, Daddy, I didn't mean to 
break the window? Kathy, my sweet little kitten, it isn't the broken window that's important. It's the fact that you continue to disregard the one thing essential to a well-ordered world. Discipline. When I was in the army, I had 300 men under me. And without discipline, they'd have been an unruly mob instead of a group of efficient soldiers. And don't you see, Kathy, this family, any family, is like an army unit working together for the greatest good. Now, you've got to be a soldier, Kathy, a good soldier, an obedient soldier. Now, what do you say? Sir, how do you transfer out of this crummy outfit? <laughs> Good morning, Jim, dear. Good morning. And how are all the... Where are the kids? They're a little late this morning, dear. Would you like some waffles for a change? Margaret, I gave those children specific instructions about breakfast. Why can't they be here when they're supposed to be? Well, I guess it's partly my fault. Betty was up late last night, and I told morning, her that... Morning, everybody. What's cooking? Bud, you interrupted your mother. Oh, I'm sorry, Mom. That's all right, dear. It's not all right. When I was a boy, we were taught to respect our elders. We spoke what we were spoken to, and... What are you doing with my tie? Is this your tie? Yes, it's my tie. Take it off. Oh, but golly, Dad. I, I said take it off. Mommy! Mommy! What is it, Kathy? Betty won't let me in the bathroom. Come down and eat your breakfast. But I have to comb my hair. You can comb it later. I'll get it. Hello. Oh, hello, Mr. Gribble. I was just getting ready to... But you can't keep the appointment. I see. Your what? Oh, taking your family to the train. Well, um, how about this afternoon? Uh, later in the week, maybe? I see. Well, look, Mr. Gribble, as long as your family is going to be out of town, how about having dinner with us? Oh, it won't be any trouble at all. How about tonight? Well, that's fine. I'll pick you up at 5.30, Mr. Gribble. Not at all, Mr. Gribble. I'll see you later, Mr. Gribble. Uh, that was Mr. Gribble. <laughs> Margaret. Daddy, every time Betty goes into the bathroom, she locks the door. And you told her not to. And she said she didn't care. Sit and... down and eat your breakfast. Tattletale. I am not a tattletale. I didn't tell him what you were doing this morning. You better not. He was shaving. <laughs> Shaving? <clears throat> but I distinctly told oh, you... I wasn't, Dad. I was just practicing. I didn't even put a blade in. But you use my best soap. I can smell it. <laughs> Jim, what about Mr. Gribble? What about him? Oh, oh, he's coming for dinner tonight. And that's another thing. Kathy, Bud, Mr. Gribble is a very important man. Uh, Jim... Just a moment, Margaret. I've been working for almost a year to get Mr. Gribble to switch the insurance on his factory. And if either of you kids makes as much as one crack about his nose... Oh, Jim. What's the matter? What's wrong with his nose, Daddy? There's nothing wrong with it. It's just big. <laughs> Margaret, don't sit there as though you were dying. What's the matter? Jim, you shouldn't have mentioned it. The children would never have even noticed Mr. Gribble's nose. Wouldn't have noticed it. How could they help but notice it? <laughs> but they wouldn't have said anything about it. Now you've put a spotlight on it, made an issue of it. Well, why not? It's as big as a balloon, and he's very sensitive. <laughs> Kathy. Daddy, I won't say a single word about Mr. Gribble's nose. There you see, Margaret. But what would happen if I stuck a pin in it? <laughs> oh, yes. Father always knows best. Well, there may be some doubt about Father knowing best in this particular instance. We'll find out in just a moment. You know, a fire that is raging out of control, a fire that isn't burning in an open fireplace or a closed furnace, but a fire that is burning all over the house, destroying everything it touches... That's the fire we all live in fear of. The sound of fire engines racing by in the dead of night isn't an exciting sound. It's a frightening sound. And the only kind of comfort we derive from hearing it is 
is a kind of a small, uneasy relief that it isn't happening to us. Small and uneasy because we know that it could be happening to us. We all hope that it never will. But that's a futile kind of hope, unless we take active steps to see that it doesn't. And the steps to prevent such a fire happening to us are really simple. Here they are. Don't smoke in bed, and don't lose track of that cigarette you're smoking somewhere around the house. Don't store up old rags and papers. Clean them out. Don't put up with defective wiring and old frayed cords. Don't use cleaning fluids that will catch fire. Don't leave matches in reach of small children. Just five steps. Follow them. If you don't, you're gambling with fire, and the odds are overwhelmingly against you. It's almost six o'clock, and in the white frame house on Maple Street, there's great activity in the dining room. Jim hasn't arrived as yet with his dinner guest, Mr. Gribble, but the Anderson kids are hard at work setting the table. Like this. Kathy, you know better than that. The forks go on the left. Forks on the left, spoons on the right. I never saw such a bunch of superstitious people. (laughs) And lay off the olives. One little olive. But sometimes I wonder if it does any good. The weary hours we spend trying to make a lady of Kathleen. We could do better with a baboon. (laughs) Mommy, they're picking on me again. Kathy, really? Squealer. Well, you were. All you do is pick on me. All right, Kathy. I'm coming. Now, what seems to be the trouble? Oh, it's nothing, Mom. It is so. He says I was a baboon. I did not, did I, Betty? Personally, I think Kathy could stand a zipper on her mouth. All right, that's enough of that. Well, the table looks very nice. Betty, run out to the kitchen and open another jar of olives. All right, Mother. Mommy. What is it now, Kathy? Mommy, I'm scared. Bud. I didn't touch her, Mom, honest. It isn't him, Mommy. It's that Mr. Gribble. Why, Kathy... Mr. Gribble is a very nice man. But his nose. What if I say something about his nose? Can't we eat in the dark so I won't see it? (laughs) You won't, dear. You won't even think about it. But I can't help it. I can't think about anything else. Mommy, can he really blow water through it like an elephant? Of course not. Where on oh, earth... I was just kidding her, Mom. I didn't think she'd believe me. <laughs> oh, Mommy, I want to be good. I don't want to spoil anything for Daddy. But I'm scared. Well, you know what I told you. If you think you're going to say something, just go outside. But she couldn't do that. It wouldn't be polite. Sure it would. She could say, well, she had to put the cat out. That's ridiculous. We don't have a cat. Anyway, the whole idea is preposterous. Oh, sure. As soon as I say something, it's preposterous. Well, just wait. You'll see. Dad's counting on getting Mr. Gribble's insurance. She'll fix it so we all wind up in the poorhouse. Bud, we won't mention it again. But, Mommy, he's right. I will. I always do. Why can't I go to bed? Why can't you tell him I got the measles? Or or the smallpox? Oh, Kathy, darling, you're going to be fine. Really, you are. We'll be proud of you. Mother, the car's coming up the driveway. Oh, I wish I was dead. (laughs) Yeah, well, that was a wonderful dinner, Miss Anderson. Really wonderful. Thank Ah. you, Mr. Gribble. Yes, sir, Margaret's a wonderful cook. (laughs) Everybody says I married her for her apple pie. <laughs> oh, Jim. Yes, indeed. A wonderful, wonderful dinner. And a wonderful family. You're a lucky man, Addison. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, your uh, youngest is the most remarkable child I've ever seen. She hasn't taken her eyes off her plate since we sat down at the table. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, I, I hadn't noticed. Don't you feel well, Kathleen? Yes, Daddy. Well, look at me when I talk to you. Yes, Daddy. <laughs> now, that's more like it, isn't it, little girl? Ooh, 
I've got to put the cat out. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Kathy, where do you think... Uh, never mind, dear. She'll be right back. I know, but since when do we... Uh, will Mrs. Gribble be gone long, Mr. Gribble? Huh? Oh, oh, a few days, a week at the most. Uh, what is it you were going to say, Anderson? Uh, something about a cat. <laughs> Kathleen, come back to the table right now. Yes, Dad. I want to talk to you. Well, what's this about a cat? Mother, it, it's 8 o'clock. Really? Oh, it can't be. Oh, uh, it is, Mom. Eight o'clock, right on the... Uh, I mean, uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, Jim, I'm sorry. Will it be all right if Betty leaves? She has that rehearsal for the church play, you know. I suppose so. Uh, Kathy, sit down and behave yourself. All right, Daddy. I'm awfully sorry I have to rush off, Mr. Gribble. Well, that's quite all right, quite all right. I used to be an actor myself when I was a boy. Uh, to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it is nobler in the, uh, the, um... Yeah, uh, doing something from Shakespeare, no doubt, huh? No, Edmund Rostand. I'm playing Roxanne in Cyrano. Betty, you'd, uh, uh, better go. No, no, just, just a minute, Anderson. <laughs> no use rushing the girl off like that. Uh, Cyrano, huh? Well, I don't think I know the piece. Cyrano de Bergerac. It's quite famous. Betty, you're, you're going to be late. Oh, one of those foreign plays, huh? Uh, what's it about? Well, actually, it's a story about a man who has a very large... Feather in his hat. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest feather you ever saw. He goes around tickling all the people with it. <laughs> Preposterous. You mean they wrote a play about that? Well, there are other things. Uh, go on, Betty. You're excused. All right, Father. Good night, Mr. Gribble. Good night, everybody. Good, Good night, night, Daddy. Daddy. <laughs> yeah, sweet girl. Lovely young lady. Thank you. We're very proud of Betty. Well, you should be. You've done a good job with her. Excellent. And that isn't easy these days. You can say that again. It's tough being a parent. You worry and figure and scheme, and then when you're all through, heaven only... <gasps> What's the matter? <laughs> What is it, dear? I thought he was going to say it. Kathy! Say what? What's all the excitement It's about? nothing, Mr. Gribble. Not, not a thing. Yeah, say, Dad. Kathleen, now where are you going? I have to put the cat out. You just put it out! <laughs> it's just, it's, she means she wants to let it in. Dad. She wants to let what in? The cat. What cat? Dad. Our cat. Since when do we have... Say, Dad. What's the matter with you? May I go up to my room and listen to the radio? No. Kathleen, come back here. All right, Daddy. Uh, I was just worried about the cat. Will someone please tell me what this is all about? It's amazing. Such devotion to a dumb animal. This is remarkable. <laughs> Dad, uh, Dad, I'm just sitting here and I'm going to miss the whole program. I said no. Bud, dear. Your father knows best. Oh, come now, folks. We mustn't be so strict. After all, what have we held of people to offer that can compete with, uh, uh, what's the program you want to hear, son? Uh, Jimmy Durante. He's keen. Uh, uh, you know, he's the fellow with the... Well, go ahead. What are you waiting for? <laughs> oh. Oh, gosh. I, I was just going to tell Mr. Gribble... Uh, you, you were going to tell me what, son? That, uh... Uh, that I'm very happy to have met you. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. Uh, good night, everybody. Good night, my boy. Good night, bud. <laughs> good night, dear. Daddy. I don't want to hear another word out of you about a cat. But, Daddy. All right, Kathy. Time for bed. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mommy. Amazing child. <laughs> <laughs> Kiss your father good night, Kathy. Good night, Daddy. Good night, kitten. Pleasant dreams. Good night, Mommy. Good night, dear. Good... Good night, Mr. Gribble. Good night, little girl. Uh, you're a very sweet child. Thank you. Uh, good night, Mr. Gribble. Good night. <laughs> well, that's over. Dear, I know you and Mr. Gribble want to talk about the insurance on his factory, Oh, no, so... no, no hurry about that. <laughs> I, uh, I just wondered if I might have another piece of that uh, wonderful pie. Oh, of course. I should have thought of it. There you are. Oh, thank you, my dear. 
Uh, tell me, Mr. Gribble, about how much insurance were you thinking of carrying on your nose? What? Oh. <laughs> We'll be right back. Did you know that annually in our country, 340,000 homes are destroyed by fire? 11,000 lives and hundreds of millions of dollars are lost in these fires in homes. Don't run the risk in your own home of a costly and tragic fire, which can be prevented. Check now and regularly on the five simple points of fire prevention. First, don't smoke in bed or discard cigarettes or matches carelessly. Two, clean out old rags, newspapers, and other inflammables from the closets, attic, and cellar. Three, repair or replace broken or defective electrical wiring or electrical equipment. Four, use non-inflammable cleaning fluids. And five, keep matches in a safe place, out of the reach of small children. It is a simple fact that nearly all the fires which destroy American homes could be prevented if these simple rules are followed. So, follow them in your own home. Remember, don't gamble with fire. You can't win. A horrible night has come and gone. In Springfield, the sun is shining, the flowers are blossoming, the birds are singing but not in the Anderson breakfast nook, like this. Jim, you're putting salt on your eggs. Well, I like salt on my eggs. I know, dear. Don't you think you ought to take them out of the shells first? <laughs> what? Oh. Well, stop staring at me, Kathleen. Eat your breakfast. Yes, Daddy. Eleven months, practically a whole year, just wasted. Maybe it isn't as bad as you think, dear. Maybe Mr. Gribble will still take the insurance. The way he stormed out of here last night? Oh, sure. I can just see that. But, Daddy, he said... I don't want to hear another word out of you. Eat your breakfast. But, Daddy, I didn't say anything about his nose. Of course not. All you could talk about was cats. <laughs> Put them out, let them in. But, Daddy, I was just trying to... Cats. Nothing but cats. If I ever hear another word about cats in this house, I'll... Hello? Oh, 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 hello, Mr. Gribble. Look, I, I want to explain about last night. You see, I... Uh, yes, Mr. Gribble. Uh, of course, Mr. Gribble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gribble. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Gribble. Jim. <laughs> what did he say? Oh, oh that's marvelous. <laughs> that's the most marvelous thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Jim, what is it? Jim. He, he said that... <laughs> Jim Anderson, if you don't tell me this instant... He, he hates me, but we're getting the insurance. It's a reward for a sweet little girl who takes such good care of her cat. Oh, <laughs> I don't get it. Join us again next week when we'll be back with Father Knows Best, starring Robert Young as Jim Anderson. In our cast were Rhoda Williams as Betty, Gene Vanderpile, Ted Donaldson, Helen Strom, and Bill Conrad. Father Knows Best was an NBC Radio Network production written by Ed James, directed by Max Hutto, and transcribed in Hollywood. This is Bill Foreman speaking. It's Ralph Edwards and Truth or Consequences next on NBC.